Um, okay, so we are very pleased to have Dr. Ben de Haas with us today. Ben de Haas studied psychology at Gießen University in Germany and then moved to London to do a PhD in neuroscience at UCL under the supervision of Professor Gerantries. He then continued to do a postdoc with Professor Sam Schwarzkopf and Professor Marty Serino, uh, who at the time were both in London. In London, he specialized in brain imaging, mostly of the visual system, including retinotopy, but not only. He then returned to Gießen in Germany, where he started his own lab and is now being funded by the prestigious ERC starting grant. Ben also studied individual eye, uh, eye movement patterns with Carl Gegenfurtner. He published in many journals and platforms, including high profile journals as PNAS, Current Biology, Nature Communication, and others. On top of these, I want to point out, to point out a very important paper. This is uh, my perspective that has been lately that has lately been published by Ben in Nature Worldviews on a topic that is much less discussed in science. Its title is What My Retraction Taught Me, and I want to applaud Ben and his colleagues, which I all know personally and highly respect them all. Um, for doing this. Um, so I want to applaud them for being honest and thorough and actually not um, only being honest with themselves, but also being brave to share this, this with others and for doing the right thing, since I believe that this is the only way to move our understanding of the world forward. If we can acknowledge our mistakes and learn from them and set an example to others. It's not an easy task, but it's definitely an easy and very fluent read. So I highly recommend it to all of you. Ben leads uh, the individual lab, studying individual differences in perception, mainly visual perception, if I'm not mistaken. This is done via psychophysics, eye tracking measurements, and your imaging. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Ben, to our seminar to tell us about your exciting work. Thank you very much, Sharon. The inevitable question, can you see my slides? I mean, yes. we've done this for, what, one and a half years, but... <laughs> It's still tricky sometimes. So thank you very, very much for the nice introduction. I'm really honored to be invited to this series, which had so many fantastic speakers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to see faces I know and uh, yeah, to be among friends. So when I look at my thumb at arm's length, then its width is about two degrees visual angle. Now the human visual field spans almost 200 degrees. But resources in the visual system are distributed very unfairly. On the retina, the density of photoreceptors drops off by two orders of magnitude. Now the slides won't progress. Sorry about that. Don't know why. Ah, now it's working. So on the retina, the density of photoreceptors falls off by two orders of magnitude as we go from the fovea to the periphery. This is inherited by visual cortex, where more cortical area is devoted to processing the central few degrees than to the entire rest of the visual field. One consequence of this is that we can only resolve clearly what's at the center of gaze. We constantly need to move our eyes across the screen in front of us. Much like breathing, we can do this consciously, but most of the time we don't even notice how we do it. Each one of us moves their eyes two or three times a second. Vision fundamentally is a sequence of eye movements and fixations. This poses a challenge to the visual system. At each moment in time, it needs to decide where to move the fovea next based on peripheral input. And we still don't really understand how this works. There are models, of course, which try to predict which parts of an image will attract our gaze. For a long time, the most prominent ones were variations of the Itty and Koch algorithm. They all follow the same basic idea. First, extract a set of pixel-wise, low-level features like luminance, color, and orientation. Then compute the local contrast for each of these features. And combine the resulting feature maps into a single weighted salience map, a general indicator of things standing out in the scene. And that is our prediction of fixation probability. The defining property of these models is that they are completely ignorant towards high level features. You don't have to know whether there are 
objects in the image, whether they are a face or a chair, all you care about are low level image computable features. This was of course highly attractive in practical terms, but it also matches the biological textbook model. We know that things like local orientation contrast can be computed in V1 at the earliest stages of cortical processing. And a prominent model of the visual system poses that after that, we have a division of labor into a ventral stream for what? Am I looking at an object, a face, a piece of text, and a dorsal stream for the where and how? Where's the interesting stuff? Where should I move my eyes next? And the Etienne Costile models are wholly compatible with this separation. The where can be computed independently of the what because it only depends on low level features. The problem is these models only work for boring images. As soon as you show interesting scenes containing stuff and people, fixations are much better predicted by where in the image is an object, where is a face, where is a piece of text. This study by Xu and colleagues used 700 images of complex scenes and delineable, uh, delineated, hand delineated and labeled 5,500 objects within these scenes. And they found that this type of semantic information, this pixel belongs to a piece of text, here was a face, there's food in the image, carried much more weight for predicting fixations. And these kinds of high level features, of course, have become image computable with the advent of deep neural networks, which have dominated gaze prediction ever since. So the what and the where do seem to interact after all. And one of the things I'd like to understand is how they do this in the human visual system. Another problem with traditional salience models is that they work with the implicit assumption that two people presented with the same image will fixate the same parts of it. Salience is a function of the image and not the individual observer. Any differences between people are disregarded. These studies typically take the correlation between fixation maps of different observers as an estimate of the noise ceiling. Any remaining differences are deemed random or not, interested, uh, not interesting. But are there systematic differences in what you and I look at when we're presented with the same image? To illustrate this question, I'd like to play a little game with you, which I hope will work on Zoom. There will be a subtle change in this image, and I'll ask you to raise your hand via video or button click as soon as you've discovered it. Ready? Go. Okay, we have someone, anybody else? Can't see most of you. Yeah, other people finding the difference. Excellent, so can anybody, anybody tell us what the difference is, what changed? The drum. Text on the drum. Anybody else? The drum. Yeah. The glasses. The glasses. So Sharon saw that the cheap trick text on the drums changed. And I don't know who it was saw the change in the face that the, the glasses of the guitar player uh, or the bass player are vanishing. So what we've just seen may point to individual variation in gaze behavior. Some of you first looked at the face and some at the text. What you see in this image may not be the same as what I'm seeing, depending on where we fixate. Now this variation could of course be random, like most salience models assume. If we repeat the game many times, there would just be you know, down to random chance, what you see first and what I see first. But by now there are a number of studies that show the opposite, there are systematic differences. For example, Andrews and Coppola and Bargary and colleagues found consistent differences in basic oculomotor traits like the saccadic latency, amplitude, and speed. And these generalize across tasks to some degree and can even be used for biometric identification. But observers also vary in 
where they look in a scene. I'll have to start this video. So surprisingly, this has a strong genetic component. In this video, we see the gaze traces of a pair of monozygotic twins, which are remarkably similar to each other, spatially and in time, over time. And they were systematically and much more so than those of dizygotic twins. Which parts of a scene we fixate and when we do that seems highly heritable, which is quite surprising to me. So given there are systematic differences in where we look, what are these differences? Could the semantic dimensions that Xu and colleagues used for a general salience model also explain the differences between us? To test this, we asked more than 100 observers to look at the same 700 complex scenes in any way they wanted. It was just a free viewing task and recorded their gaze. And then we compared patterns of fixations between observers. This person was quite interested in the faces in the scene. The green circle shows their first fixation after image onset, so the landing point of the first saccade, and the remaining fixations are shown in purple. This observer in comparison seemed much more interested in the hands and in objects being touched. And when we quantify the individual percentage of dwell time spent on faces across images, we find quite a range across 50 observers. The difference is much, uh, the difference is more than a factor two. And crucially, these differences are consistent across independent sets of images. If you look at a face more than I do, for one set of images, that's an almost perfect predictor for our differences for a second independent sets of images. Every point in this gray scatter plot is one observer and you see their individual percentage of dwell time spent on faces for the odd images versus the even images. And to the left, you see example fixations by two of these observers, the blue one and the one shown in orange. And these Consistent individual differences also hold for the landing position of the first saccade, the first fixations. The target of these immediate saccades after on, image onset are thought to be under limited voluntary control. So it doesn't seem to be a question of someone today feeling like or deliberating to look more at faces, but to point to more profound differences between your visual system and mine. We find such reliable differences for the tendency to look at faces, text, hands, emotional expressions, objects with implied motion, and food. Not all of them are as consistent as for faces and text, but also clearly not random. And these tendencies are also consistent across time. When we re-invited participants after several weeks, their individual differences replicated. So this seems to reflect a trait rather than a state of the observer. And it's not just that some people have longer dwell times in general, right? No, this is the fraction of their dwell time spent on a particular um, class of objects. There are these differences too. So the saccadic rate is dramatically different between observers, um, but this is the, the fraction, this is a relative measure. Um, and some of these differences seem to go along with differences in perceptual ability. There's a moderate but significant correlation between the tendency of first fixations to land on faces and skills in face recognition as indexed by the Cambridge face memory test. And this relationship with face recognition performance uh, is, has recently been corroborated by uh, findings of my PhD student Marcel Linke who collaborated with Maike Ramon at the University of Fribourg. Maike has this database of super recognizers, so people who are extremely good at face recognition. In fact, they're so good that the police is working with Maike and these people are hired to scan CCTV footage for suspects. And Marcel found that super recognizers fixate faces significantly more than controls when looking at these complex scenes. And they don't only look more towards faces, but also to objects with implied motion, but less towards text and objects being touched. And this seeming push-pull relationship between these types of objects is something we also came across um, in controls and which replicated across multiple samples. 
There are systematic correlations between fixation tendencies. Most importantly, the tendency to fixate faces is a negative predictor of fixating text and objects that are being touched. And that to me, it's highly speculative, but that to me is quite interesting because as we know, ventral visual cortex is tiled into areas with categorical preferences for faces, limbs, and text. At least in those who learned to read, we find these text patches as well. And we know from a recent macaque study that monkeys, uh, by, by Akaro and colleagues, that monkeys who grew up face deprived don't develop these cortical face patches and instead have more cortex responding to hands. And they also, interestingly, have lacking salience for faces and fixate the hands more instead. So that made me wonder whether, contrary to the textbook model, these ventral areas may be involved in detecting fixation targets. And if that's the case, there may be a push-pull competition between them for both cortical real estate and gaze control, which could play out differently in individual brains. If more of your ventral stream is dedicated to face processing, maybe that also means that you have a higher individual salience for faces. So to test this idea, my PhD student Max Borda uses fMRI to map these areas in individuals who also take part in our eye tracking experiments. We identify patches with a preference for faces, text, and hands with a standard localizer to quantify how much of the inferior temporal cortex is devoted to each of these categories in the individual brain. And here you can see this for my brain. We simply calculate the proportion of voxels in IT preferring faces, hands, and text to quantify their relative prominence in the ventral stream. And as you can see, I'm spending much too much time reading, and I should look more at people probably. If these areas are involved in detecting these features for saccades, then their relative dominance may predict individual, fi individual fixation tendencies. Um, a related hypothesis is that ventral stream information about what's out there may inform gaze behavior by white metatracts, feeding this information to classic dorsal attention areas like IPS. And we collaborate with Mareike Grotea, who helped us to implement a multi-shell sequence for diffusion-weighted images and with probabilistic fiber tracking for this. The idea is that we estimate the proportion of fibers in the vertical occipital fasciculus having their ventral endpoints in each of these patches. Then we can test whether that connectivity fingerprint is predictive of individual fixation tendencies. So we're using these individual differences as a tool, hoping to understand the general mechanisms of high-level salience. Unfortunately, I now give this teaser on the MRI data, but I can't report on any results of this yet because I started the lab in 2020 and scanning in a COVID world is going very, very slowly. And especially if you want to do individual differences and you need a large N, we're nowhere near the sample size we want because we had more shutdowns than times where we were able to do this so far. But, um, Unfortunately, we had tons of eye tracking data. We could do some interesting things with in that time. When we asked this type of question, how does the visual system detect specific types of objects outside the fovea to bring them there? It's important to note that not all fixations serve this purpose. Yes, many fixations do come from elsewhere and then land on an object to discover it for the fovea. In this image, these would be the fixations first landing on the face, the fixation first landing on the book, and that one first landing on the teddy. We call these fixations uh, detection fixations because they detect an object for foveal vision. Something that was only available to extra foveal vision is now moved inside the fovea for the first time. But both scan path and heat map representations of fixation behavior do not differentiate these from other types of fixations. It's all just lumped together in one big bucket. So these immediate follow-up fixations on the same object after I landed on there would just go in there and contribute in the same way. Uh, and no, there are plenty of these. 
We call those inspection fixations. You're drilling for further detail by slightly shifting the fovea around on a given object after you first landed there. And then there are returns when the eye jumps back to revisit an object after going elsewhere. All of these are, as I said, typically lumped together, but probably serve different purposes, different perceptual functions. Detection fixations cross the bridge from extrafoveal to foveal vision. Inspection fixations extract specific details from a given object and returns can refresh our memory or extract even more detail from a previously fixated object. And we wondered whether this functional classification we propose here could help us to understand different sub-processes during scene viewing. Are there systematic differences between these types of fixations and in the factors driving them? So my PhD student Marcel and I started splitting up our data into detection, inspection, and return fixations. And we tested whether across observers, the heat maps for a given image are more similar within one of those classes than between them. So we now create three heat maps for each of these classes individually. And this is indeed the case. Across observers, the D, I, and R fixations are much more similar within one class of fixations than between them. So this is the uh, similarity across observers looking at the same images when you compare the detection fixations of uh, the odd and the even observers for the set of images and the inspection and the return fixations to the same class of fixations, they're much more similar than when you compare between these classes. Here's another example um, where the difference of this is striking. Participants explore quite a few objects, but successive inspection fixations are heavily concentrated on the screen where smaller details may reveal interesting content and they mostly return to the face seen in half profile after going elsewhere. And across images, observers are consistently different in how much of their fixation time they devote to each of these classes. Some spend twice as much of their dwell time on detection or inspection as others. And the differences in the tendency for returns are even greater, approaching a factor of four. So the way people inspect a scene is radically different between observers. They vary along a huge spectrum from drillers, people who really spend more than half their fixation time staying where they are, just looking for details um, of an object they are already landed on, to explorers who have no time for that. They spend up to 80% of their time jumping to new objects or hurrying back to the one they visited before. The fact that these differences are so consistent both across images and observers, point to this classification mapping onto something real, a segregation of functional subprocesses. Another hint of this capturing a functional difference is that over viewing time for a given image, there is a steady decline of detection fixations relative to inspection and returns. This matches previous reports of a shift between an ambient mode of gaze behavior towards a focal mode with longer fixation durations and shorter saccadic amplitudes. But note that this is not the same thing as what we are proposing here. The detection inspection return scheme can uncover steady changes over the duration of a trial, but crucially, it allows us to classify each individual fixation according to its presumed function. And there is no simple one-to-one -one mapping of fixation duration and saccade length onto these classes, detection, inspection, and returns. Fixation durations steeply rise during the first second of viewing time for all of these fixation types, and then they plateau a little later for inspections and returns, but there clearly is a general trend. The interfixation distance, uh, the saccade length, however, is a bit more nuanced. Unsurprisingly, inspection fixations, which by definition are on the same object, are always nearby. They have a very small interfixation difference. But detections start with huge jumps across the image to then after about a second drop to about half that distance, while returns climb up to that plateau from a much lower level and more slowly. In other words, when we return to objects early in the trial, we only do this if we're nearby, but later on, 
we can be compelled to cross larger distances to jump back to a given object. And the distinction between DI and R fixations matters when we try to understand which parts of an image attract fixations. When we fit a salience model separately to each type of fixation, we see that some of the predictor weights vary wildly between fixation types. Whether or not a face has an emotional expression makes no difference for detection fixations. So for the question whether we fixate the face at all, um, but emotional expressions strongly compel us to drill deeper on the face with inspection fixations and to come back with returns. Similarly, and not surprisingly, the salience of text objects is mainly due to inspection because this is the way reading works. Once we are fixating a piece of text, we're very likely to make follow-up fixations on this object. And finally, a cool technical aspect of this is that we can approximate DI and R fixation maps pretty well without metadata on the locations of objects in the image. Remember, we only could do all of this because we're using these stimuli that come with metadata telling us which pixels in the image belong to the same object. But what if you don't have that, if you use an image set without object masks? We found that the DIR classification of fixations can be approximated very well with a simple spatial heuristic, which is completely agnostic towards image content. We simply define a Euclidean distance threshold to guess whether a given pair of fixations landed on the same object or not. And we found that 10% of the overall image width is a very good proxy for that, um, which leads to surprisingly similar results to the, analysis, uh, to the analysis using knowledge of the object locations and, and using these pixel masks. So as long as you know the order and locations of fixations, that's all you need to readily apply this classification. And we hope that this will be useful, not just for our own research, but also in other contexts. The first draft of the paper is written and we'll publish these uh, complete with example data and code. So if this sounds interesting to, see, to you, then please stay tuned. Uh, we hope we'll make it usable for as many people as possible. Another tool that may be helpful for others as well is a short test of individual gaze biases. When Marcel collaborated with Maika on the super recognizers, um, these participants saw the full set of 700 scenes introduced by Xu and colleagues. This yields very good and rich data, but it's a long experiment. About 45 minutes is the absolute minimum, I'd say. If we want to go beyond our typical psych student sample and test large samples or special populations, we need something better. We need something shorter, something more efficient. So Marcel set out to find and validate a subset of images for a quick test. And it turned out that at least for the most important gaze biases towards faces and text, you can get decent estimates with just 40 images. Each one is seen for three seconds. So the test literally takes two minutes viewing time. This is published, including materials. So if you do anything where you think that individual differences in gaze could be interesting, you have an eye tracker around, then I think it's worth just investing those two minutes uh, to probably get some interesting data on top. And for us, this already opened up a few interesting avenues. This is my five-year-old daughter and some of her pilot data for a study we're running with a developmental group in Gießen. In Germany, school only starts age six, and it is very apparent that my daughter's dog and face salience still far surpasses that for text. It will also be interesting to see whether the variance among kids is higher than that which we see for adults. Are there canonical attention priors which children have yet to learn to the same degree as adults? Marcel is also collaborating with clinicians from the University of Marburg using this short test in children with uh, ASD, ADHD, and schizophrenia. There are reports that gaze behavior may be diagnostic for these conditions, but to decide whether gaze can really serve as a diagnostic marker, we need to do better than a few dozen controls that we compare the data of clinical groups to, because we know from our previous data that there is a lot of variance between people, even if we test only 50 of them. So 
we want to get something like the Z value, like the how many standard deviations away from the mean are you with the given type of gate behavior. So we're also collaborating with Mathematicum, a local science museum, which at least before COVID had 100,000 visitors per year. Um, and Marcel developed this interactive exhibit in which you can self-administer that short test. And once we're out of the pandemic and they can open again, which they're currently doing, and we'll, I'm actually there tomorrow in the museum and we're talking about the casing, um, we hope to gather around 10,000 data sets this way, which would go a long way in the direction of a benchmark sample to compare clinical groups to. Also because they have a really mixed audience, they have from kindergarten groups to pensioners, so we could do age stratification and uh, yeah, hope to get a bit richer data for comparison here. But another question that's still open to my mind is whether these dimensions we identified to be important for individual differences in gaze, whether these are the dimensions of individual gaze behavior, how much of the variance in object fixations can they really explain? And to answer this question, um, we need to go back and forget about the semantic labels like faces or text. We, we want to be more open than that. It could be whatever features that maybe we didn't have in mind that are important for this. So the thing we did is that we note the dwell time for each individual object among the thousands in the images. So for a given observer, we get a long sparsely populated vector because most of these objects were not fixated at all. Now, for a pair of observers like Chavon and me, we can compute the Euclidean distance between our vectors. This is a simple metric of how different we were in distributing our fixations across these thousands of objects, which is independent of any semantic categorization of these objects. And if we do this for 100 observers, we get an observer similarity matrix showing the distances between all pairs of observers, the similarity or the, the lack of similarity, the dissimilarity. It shows us who is more and less similar to whom. The first question is how much of that is consistent? If Sharon and I are particularly similar in our fixations for one set of images, will we also be among the more similar observers for a second set of images? And the answer is yes. The difference between observers for odd and even images correlate with 0.9. If you and I are particularly different for one set of images, we'll also be for the other. So that's our benchmark. 80% of the differences in object fixations are potentially explainable. How much of that do we capture with our handful of dimensions? We tested this by fitting a linear model. We tried to predict the overall differences in object fixations as the weighted sum of the differences in the tendency to look at faces, text, and so on. Because some of these predictors are correlated with each other, we use ridge regression to nudge the model towards a sparse, efficient solution. And we make sure to cross-validate. So we learn the weights of these predictors on one set of, one set of images and then evaluate the model predictors for the similarities and dissimilarities of observers for the remaining images. And this way we can capture 27% of the explainable variance in object fixations. The bulk of this is down to differences in fixation, uh, in fixating faces and text. So these dimensions do seem very important for our differences, but at the same time, we're still far from capturing everything that's going on. So what else may be going on? Max is currently collecting online ratings for the perceived valence, arousal, attractiveness, age, gender, and several other features of the people in these images. Maybe we don't just differ in our tendencies to look at people, but more specifically in our tendency to fixate happy, sad, or attractive faces. Even though I can say at this point that our first results point to the fact that apparently for everyday scenes without extreme emotional expressions, people don't really agree on which of these faces look sad or happy, which is an interesting finding in itself. Um, but we're also asking several other things about age, et cetera, and maybe you know, we'll at least test a few more dimensions and see whether they can explain more variance in the differences between people. <laughs> 
Bucks and many are poor. Ben, ben, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask in these vectors, uh, there's not much about the actual, let's say, trajectory or temporal dimension. Yeah. Um, you just have the quantification. And I was wondering if this, you know, if somebody is more jittery, uh, somebody else is more. I don't know, central or is jumping less. So maybe the size of the fixations, the frequency in some way or in interaction with some category at least, maybe that's something else that should be taken into account. Yeah, so, I I mean, suggestion. I mean, yeah. so, so this is a, a bit of a humble approach because we're only trying to predict the, the distribution across the objects and we're getting rid, you're exactly right, we're getting rid completely of the temporal domain. But as I've shown previously in this detection, inspection, refixation thing, there we have, this is one way of looking at, at temporal order. And we also see these differences, these tendencies in, in you know, how, how long the fixation rate differs between participants, et cetera, et cetera. What I haven't shown you is, so Marcel, when he worked on the DIR thing, has also found that there are some correlations between, so you can explain part of the variance is shared between these two things. So what types of objects you fixate on more can be explained partly by how much you emphasize the DIRR fixations. And if we want to explain both things, then we can look at uh, scan path similarity. And that's also a part of this ongoing project where we want to look at the dimensions of individual gaze. And it's to me, it's still, that temporal aspect is really interesting. Also the, the what you mentioned, the, the jittery versus non-jittery type of gaze, because it seems so fundamental. It, all, it almost seems independent of the stimulus you're looking at. And um, yeah, we are, so uh, I, I now have, uh, this year was joined by two new PhD students and one of them is working on saccades a lot and actually started working on micro saccades uh, as well. And Joram and I will talk about this later. Um, right, so another thing Max and uh, our poor student research assistants did was to, uh, <laughs> to expand the pixel map annotations for all the depicted humans in these images. And across images, there are more than a thousand people. And we now have hand-drawn delineations and labels for every head, eye, mouth, hand, arm, leg, torso, and the interface region. That's an additional 6,000 pixel masks, which is more than the total of the original. The most amazing thing about this to me is that our research assistants are still willing to work with us, at least most of them, and uh, don't seem to hate me. And when we publish this, we'll make all materials available so the community can benefit from, benefit from this as well, um, these enhanced meta information on the masks. Um, and using these new annotations, Max found that observers show very consistent and large differences in their tendency to fixate these features, most prominently eyes and mouths. And he also confirmed the push-pull mechanism between fixations towards hands and faces. Something similar is going on when we zoom in on face fixations. If looking at the face, you tend to fixate the eyes more, you fixate the mouth less. And this replicates or echoes findings by Matthew Peterson showing that the preferred height of fixations towards a face is individually different. Face directed saccades of some people tend to land in the eye region and those of others are shifted towards the mouth. Importantly, Peterson has shown that this landing point is individually optimal. Observers perform best at face identification when they are free to saccade to their preferred landing position. What's more, Peterson later found in a painstaking mobile eye tracking study that where people spontaneously fixate in the lab is an almost perfect predictor of gaze behavior in the wild. So eye lookers consistently look higher up in faces they encounter in real life and mouth lookers consistently fixate further down. But 
hang on, how can this possibly be? Why is it seemingly better for some of us to fixate the eye region and for some of us to fixate further down? Why are some of us eye lookers and others nose or mouth lookers? There are two main hypotheses. The first is that face recognition uses an internal face template, which is stored in retinotopic coordinates and shifted between observers for whatever reasons. Maybe you just ran, had random differences in your gaze behavior after you were born. We then look at faces in a way that tries to bring the face on our retina in register with this face template. There is some evidence that neural tuning for different facial features is distributed unevenly across the visual field and that observers show idiosyncratic visual biases in face perception. If we have individually shifted face templates, we may either be born with them or learn them over time. For instance, if you find eye contact unpleasant, you may start looking further down in faces for that reason. But over time, this will shift our internal face template in that direction, and it becomes perceptually ideal for you to fixate this way. We may start looking at faces in different ways for all sorts of reasons. Where we look in a face, and specifically whether we look at the eyes or not, has been the focus of cheesy attempts at romance, poetry, a never-ending stream of pop songs, cultural conventions, and research into social cognition and clinical tendencies and conditions such as social anxiety or autism. An early decline in the tendency to fixate the eyes has even been proposed as a biomarker for autism. So we may start looking at faces for reasons that are not perceptual in origin, but over time, this could shape our face template and ultimately face perception. However, there is an alternative hypothesis, which to the best of my knowledge has not been tested yet. The difference between eye and mouth lookers may not be face specific at all. We know that beyond the general drop off of visual fidelity in the periphery, there are idiosyncratic visual field biases. One observer may have a slightly higher cortical resolution in the upper fovea compared to the lower, whereas it may be the other way around for the next person. Such low level domain general biases, of course, would predict similar differences in gaze behavior. Places, placing faces in such inhomogeneous visual fields, someone with higher fidelity in the upper visual field would do well to fixate lower in the face and vice versa. So both hypotheses predict the differences we see in face looking. However, they do differ in their prediction regarding the relationship between face fixations and the way we look at stuff. If the difference between eye and mouth lookers is down to shifted face templates, the way we look at a can of soda should be unaffected by this. If, however, the difference between eye and mouth lookers goes back to domain general differences in low level processing, they should generalize to all types of stimuli, not just faces. The way you look at a can of soda should then be a good predictor of whether you're an eye or a mouth looker. So here's a straightforward experiment. In fact, we were able to reuse data from an experiment we recently published, which was fortunate given COVID. And in this experiment, 101 observers freely view those 700 scenes that I've talked about a lot by now, um, like the one you're seeing here. They had their head in a chin and forehead rest and were eye tracked with an eye link 1000 plus and defining fixations using standard criteria. Each image was shown for three seconds and in blocks of 100 images, which were followed by recalibration. And given we now have masks for all inner face regions, mouths and eyes, we can extract all fixations landing on the inner face regions and determine their height relative to the vertical distance between eyes and mouths. A fixation landing exactly at the height of the eye region would be coded one. A fixation bang in the middle 0 0.5 and this fixation below the mouth minus 0 0.2, sorry. Similarly, we coded all object fixations according to their height between the vertical extreme points of an object they landed on. So this would be one in the upper region. 
This way, we pooled all fixations of a given observer across all images and calculated the average height of fixations landing on objects and the average height of fixations in the interface region relative to the eyes and mouths. Here, we see the face fixations of two extreme observers. The red one at the top clearly prefers the eye region, while the blue one at the bottom has bias to fixate the mouth region. The green scatter points, sorry, uh, yes. The green scatter points on, this, um, on, on these images show the landing point of the first saccade towards the faces and the red scatter, those are the remaining subsequent ones. And they're pretty consistent across images. And the data clearly show that this is correlated with the tendency to fixate higher up or lower down within objects. This shows in objects as diverse as spoons, mugs, or mobile phones. Our blue example observer clearly likes to fixate lower down in these as well, whereas the red observer prefers higher landing points. Note that these images were shown at a size of 29 by 22 degrees of visual angle, so these differences are large compared to the accuracy of the eye tracker and calibration procedures. And Sorry, Ben, these are the top of the objects or the top of the picture? Because some of these pictures are sideways. Yes, they're the top of the objects in the top being defined in image space. So the topmost pixel in image space belonging to a given object is the top of the object for that. Uh, so again, image space, that's like with respect to gravity where the observer is, not where the image was taken. Exactly, exactly. So your visual field coordinates are what's mattering to us in this case. Um, yeah, uh, and preliminary data also show that these differences are stable across sessions separated by several weeks, which we think renders calibration artifacts an unlikely explanation. The finding that fixation behavior towards faces is predicted by fixations towards stuff is in line with the hypothesis that both are caused by domain general visual field biases. However, our data don't tell us which ones they are. As soon as we can open the lab again, we want to test a number of candidates, including acuity and contrast and crowding sensitivity. Our findings also don't tell us how to make sense of the fact that eye avoidance correlates with aspects of social cognition. In our sample, individual differences in gaze behavior towards things and faces share little more than half the variance. So there may be room for an independent social factor, which probably would become more salient in situations outside the lab. And even though, though it may seem unlikely, we currently cannot rule out that low-level visual field biases have a relation to social cognition. So as always, further research is needed. And we're looking forward to the day where we can fully start data collection again. We're slowly starting, but uh, yeah, I hope, I hope we can carry on for a while now before the Delta variant is hitting. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for your attention. Our funders, of course, our collaborators, but most of all, my wonderful team that managed to do all of this in this crazy year and a half of a pandemic and made setting up a lab fun. The PhD students, Marcel Linka and Max Broda, whose work I presented today, Petra Borowska and Diana Kolenda, and our Click Warrior student RAs, Diana Weisleder, Tamara Alzheimer, and Elizabeth Senka. Ben, thank you very much. I'd like to invite everybody to unmute yourself and give Ben a big applause for a wonderful and inspiring talk. Yeah. And, um, and um, yeah, I, I'm opening the stage for questions, of course. Um, I mean, I have a few questions yeah. of my own, but um, I'm not. Can I ask a question, Sharon? Yeah, sure. Hi, Ben. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, if I understand correctly, most, if not all, of the data you've shown was free viewing. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, seeing as we've all got different perceptions of what reality should be or what we'd like to find in a picture. Uh, ice cream might excite me, um, 
something else might cite the person sitting next to me. Um, would you expect to see similar data trends if there was some sort of possibly unlinked but, but specific um, uh, purpose when they were looking? It wasn't just free viewing. Um, so I think it, it very much depends on the task, probably. So you may be able to reduce the variance a little bit if the task is asking you to look at faces, say, then I'd expect that everybody would start looking at faces. So one thing we've started trying, and uh, just before we had to close the lab, but now we have a new batch of students who will start this again, um, is that we used a more open task. So we did a change blindness experiment, like the, the little mock demo I did with you, um, with participants who also completed the free viewing paradigm. And the question was whether people who are, have a you know, stronger tendency to fixate faces, for instance, are more likely to detect the changes in faces faster um, and whether the gaze biases persist during the, the search task. And there was some level of consistency. It wasn't as strong as during the free viewing, but we also had fewer stimuli. So there's a bit of an ambiguity here whether it was down to having fewer data um, but there definitely were con significant correlations between the two. So it doesn't completely, these differences don't evaporate completely, but they may become weaker when you add in a task. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, can I ask someone? Yeah. Uh, hi, Ben. Thanks. Very interesting talk and cool data. I have a question about the, the, uh, the distinction to the DIR kind of saccades and to the variability between observers in, in uh, let's say, in the amount of detection saccades. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, I wonder if, if you have an idea about what would it, what it, is it related to in the observer? Let's say someone that makes more detection saccades why? Or, uh... that, that is an extremely good question. So, um, and I've, I'm wondering about this question because it, it seems to be related to uh, something like the, uh, also like the, the saccadic frequency. So as I said, we started looking at saccades, not just fixations as well. And these are like the DIR consistencies, they're crazy consistent in their differences. And they're also super large. It's like, you know, often with psychological traits, we're not used to them being more than the differences in body height, right? We don't have a factor two or three between us with regards to that. And so um, I don't know, but my, and this is not a very informed guess, but my guess would be that there's something that's not purely perceptual to this, that there's something that is very, very happening at a very fundamental biological level. It could be related to neurotransmitter levels. It could be related, there, there could be perceptual effects. So one, this is getting really speculative. So one of the things I found quite interesting when I saw it was there, I unfortunately I forgot the authors, like two or three years ago, there was a nature neuroscience paper showing that across species, you can predict the amplitude of saccades um, by an interaction of typical receptive field sizes and uh, the, the um, uh, spatial frequency content of natural scenes, such that saccades lead to a de-adaptation. So you're trying to decoupling the, the input over time in a way that counteracts adaptation. And you see that even in, in animals that don't have a fovea. So they make saccades and they probably make saccades for that reason. And I'm wondering whether there could be differences in our adaptation rates between observers or just something very, my, my guess, my hunch would be something low level biological, but I don't know. I, it could also be some, we tried correlating fixation tendencies to big five personality traits at some point. That would be the other end of the spectrum, I guess, something very high level. Uh, cognition personality related we didn't we found like correlations that didn't survive multiple testing corrections there may be something like a correlation of 0.2 or so but i didn't deem that super interesting 
but guesswork so far. I, I, I'd really like to know. This is one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in um, to find out. Also, whether we, we perceive the world differently if we're looking at it in such wildly different ways. Thanks. I have also a few ideas, but I'm going to talk to you later, I guess. Yes, please. Then there are many, many uh, discussions upcoming your way later on. Okay. Um, Sam has a question. He's sorry he cannot speak aloud at this time. So it's about the uh, vertical relative to object gaze location. Um, in the faces, you define the distance between the eyes and mouth. But in the object, it refers to the extreme edges, top and bottom of the object. So you, do you think that might have affected the results in some way? No, because we have, of course, done it for the interface mask. And I, it, if you take the full head, then you still see it. But it seems to become a bit more noisy. And that's because some people have wild, you know, lots of hair on top and stuff. But it works for all three approaches. So we tried it for the eye and mouth distance and the interface and the uh, and the full head. And the reason we focused on the eye mouth distance is of course that that's the most beautiful result, but it, it doesn't make a big difference. It's also that the eye mouth, the eye mouth distance is the one that has been used in these papers by Peterson and colleagues. And it's also showing off a little bit that we can do this now because we did these thousands of additional masks. Um. Okay, uh, Sam, well, I hope that's okay. If not, you can I have uh, one write question. One. Oh. <laughs> sure. Ben, can you hear me? Yes. Well, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I just have a, I, it's possibly a silly question, uh, but uh, it just occurred to me when you were talking about the preference between mouth and eyes and so on, that um, uh, one of the ways to figure out if, if somebody, I mean, um, one potential qualitative assessment of somebody's hearing abilities or just whether in terms of hearing or in terms of familiarity with the languages, whether they lip read and so on. Now, I understand that you have demonstrated that with objects, you get a similar effect. So it's very unlikely to be that. So my first question is whether you think there may be a little bit of that going on potentially. The second question I have is, so your prediction is that if you were to do an experiment where somehow you could generate movies of uh, people where uh, the mouth is on top and the eyes are at the bottom. I understand this is not a very natural movie to look at, but suppose that after a while observers get used to it and so on, they start interacting more naturally with this species, with this new species. So your, your expectation is that you will reverse the trend. So the, get in the data, I'm saying. So you would see that those who look at the mouth, they look at the eye just because it's an up-down bias rather than having anything to do with eyes and mouth. So there are, there are two informed answers I think I can give to that. So the first one, the, the auditory aspect is um, people have shown, uh, Michael Bouchon and others, I think that... Um, it, it would be adaptive to look more at the mouth if you want, you know, there, there is a, there is a, um, the individual differences in where you look at the face are a predictor of the strength of the McGurk illusion, for instance. So it, it, it does have an effect on the multisensory processing. Um, the second uh, question is, we, do know, I think there is an abstract, I think, which wasn't published as a paper in which, if I'm not mistaken in my memory, where uh, Matthew Peterson said they, they found that these biases and where people look in a face were preserved relative to eyes and mouths preserved when the face is inverted, which is pretty much the scenario you're describing and which seems to contradict this idea of that it's it being a visual field bias. But I can imagine it's it's what the same lab, the uh, the Miguel Axstein lab also published a paper at some point where they try to retrain people by giving them uh, an artificial scotoma in where they would look at uh, in, in faces and also other types of objects. And it turned out 
with objects that works pretty well, but with faces it doesn't. So I can imagine that you start looking at a face in a certain way because of the visual field biases, but that this somehow gets locked in relative to the features. So that you, you know, you finding your landing position on the face is tied to the features in the end. And one aspect of this, which may be relevant here is that we also found that the, the differences in where people look at the face are much more consistent than the differences in where they look at objects. We have a lot more variance. If you look at the individual distributions, then they're a lot broader for the uh, object fixations, which partly is probably down to the objects not being as stereotypical and the masks being, you know, the, the, the one example I showed you with the screen, the bottom pixel wasn't the bit at the front of the screen, but it was a CRT and it has this bit extending it at the end, which goes lower down. And we don't, given we just use the object pixel mask, we can't discriminate that, well, you'll fixate lower down within this. And so th there may be more noise in the object uh, data for that reason, but there may also, you know, objects are just more different to each other than uh, faces, which are very distinct class. So I can imagine that this is another reason why for faces, you have a very strictly very stereotypical way of fixating, which is locked to the features as such. Okay, thank you. Okay. Lovely. Ben, there's another question from Veronica. I'm not sure I can um, read the, um, I'm not sure I'm reading. Okay, Veronica Lukian something. Um, I'm not, okay, anyway, when people perform free drawing during psychological tests, people of low self-esteem tend to draw most of the objects at the bottom of the paper. Can it be that people who tend to fixate on the bottom of the image have lower self-esteem? I don't know. I wasn't familiar with that finding. That's, that's interesting, that's surprising to me. I, I have no idea. I should look this up. Okay, I'll send you the ch chats, by the way, so you can have a look at the questions that people asked. Thanks. Um, I wanna ask a question myself, and that's about the um, partition into the uh, detection, uh, inspection, and the R. Um, um, so, how did you decide that? Was it by um, a saccade that was, I don't know, you said some tenth, one tenth of the size of the image in the images that you didn't have information uh, or tagging about, but was it, uh, where, was it when there was a saccade that was more than some size? I mean, how did you decide uh, whether they finished detection or was it just the first decade that was the detection or when did you decide that's the end of the detection and now um, there's so um, the, inspection? How did, just technical question. Uh, our uh, definition of detection was literally just the first fixation landing on a given object. It's, it's just the very first one landing on there. Okay. That's a very easy thing to do when you have the labels, obviously, because you know, okay, this is the first fixation that landed on this region of the image. Um, and in the, when, when we tried to rerun the analysis without using these object masks, then it was indeed this 10% of the image width. So we said, is this the first, we, for, a given, for a given fixation, we check, is there in a radius of 10% of the image width is there any other fixation that landed there previously? And if so, was it the immediately preceding one? Then we're into uh, inspection. We're just in the same uh, okay. area that we were in with the previous fixation and we're staying there and drilling. Um, if the one, the, the preceding fixation was further away, but there were other ones before that there, then we call it a return. And if it's the first fixation within a radius of 10% of the image width, we say it's a detection. And, and as I said, the data really are very similar to what we get when we do the analysis uh, with the object masks. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, um, Okay, um, are there more questions? 
yes. about this fascinating uh, talk. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I have a, I have one question. Thank you, Ben. Again, it was great. I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, there are definitely there are definitely some people which are better in face recognition than others. And my question is, if there are also some um, difference in the people who maybe are better in face recognition and maybe they are more focusing on the eye um, and maybe or they more focusing on the mouth so is there some uh, interesting data good good question so i haven't shown this but uh what Marcel found and other people have found before us actually is that the um the super recognizers interestingly didn't fixate the eye region more they seem to fixate more centrally on the face so they seem to be more no nose lookers if anything which you can then speculate about this being, you know, more holistic processing maybe because they're taking in all features at once, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, um, Ben, I'd like to thank you again for a wonderful talk. And um, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, everybody, welcome to uh, also uh, applaud. And um, I, I just want to mention next week we will have um, Hillel Aviezel with us. We'll talk about emotions, facial emotions. I don't know the title, precise title yet, but um, I will publish that um, at the same time. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, Joram, you can stop recording now, but uh, we can stay, uh, <laughs> stay some more. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.